Hi, hello. Welcome to my part of the Apocalyptic Craft panel for Magic and Ecology today. I'm really inspired to be part of this series of events and I'm very intrigued to see how this cross-pollination will evolve over time and I'm looking forward to seeing some of the other talks. I've managed to catch a few and very much looking forward to the Q&A with Peter on Friday for this panel. So for my part in the panel, I thought it would be quite interesting and relevant actually in this context to be focusing on my own personal experience being within the arena of witchcraft, art and ecology seeing the craft as an energy force and looking at the importance of recognizing art as a magical tool or in itself a magical manifestation so just to i'll just like briefly introduce myself regarding my magical practice and my art practice so regarding my magical practice i am in um I was going to say the old fashioned sense of the word, but not, but I would say I'm a traditional witch in the fact that I don't follow the Garnerian tradition of witchcraft. I am an animist and I'm also a thelemite. So this probably makes me a kind of eclectic witch of some kind um, because I work with various different energies and. <clears throat> paths. Um, I would say more importantly for this talk, I want to focus on how I work with magic and ecology as a curator and interdis interdisciplinary artist. So I'm a visual artist who works across various media, mainly with objects, sculpture and performative rights. My rights are both public and private. And I guess then all of the paraphernalia, which is left over from the rites, are I display as installation and artifacts. And I'm also keeping some kind of archive. And in that way, I see it almost as a kind of rewriting of the past and the future. Very interested in forging new mythologies for ourselves and in the use of something like the Jungian active imagination in in creativity and in forging change and catharsis. So that's how I, you know, seeing art as a magical tool and a tool for change. I think arts were a very important kind of portal in that sense. Um, I'm currently studying my MFA, Master in Fine Art at Goldsmiths University. So it's quite interesting to see how you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, the institutions maybe wouldn't have accepted such magical thinking. And maybe they don't accept it now, but we'll see, we'll see how this evolves with my work in time. So I would say encompassing all of this with my witchcraft and my art, is the fact that I come from the starting point of being within the magical body, the witch's body, and the, the, the place of the body within the cosmos and within society. And all of my work is empirical. Um, that is experience-led research, and, and it, it comes from within and then it becomes external rather rather than I'm not saying I don't have any outside influence but all of the outside influence is to do with my own personal interpretation so it's a, <clears throat> a form of phenomenology so regarding my own path and how I came to having this marriage between my art and my magical practice it has been one which, when I look back now, it's, it's really obvious to me, but I think at the time when I was evolving, it wasn't so obvious. So I was actually all, most of my twenties, 
I was an acti activist. I was um, extremely political and radical when I was younger. I gave up eating meat when I was 12 or 13, which back in the 80s was quite rare. Um, I was an environmental activist in my late teens, and then this continued later on in my 20s. I was also an animal rights activist and involved in other causes. And, I, and this also bled through into my personal artwork at the time. So I worked a lot as a community artist and using art as a tool for change with um, different minority groups in the community. So a, a type of art therapy I was working with quite a lot. And then I gave all this up for a while when I concentrated on my own art practice. And then it wasn't until I was living in Sweden and, and decided to come out of the broom closet with my art and start focusing my art practice around my magical practice that I, I realized looking back that all of this was, it, it just gelled together so well. The, you know, the fact my work was about re-enchantment and rewilding and the connection of the body to the land just made perfect sense because that's where I've been all along. It's just I didn't have the discourse or the, the narrative to actually explain this. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure when I was first at art school, this wasn't something we would have been talking about either. I mean, I do remember when I studied printmaking in 2006 and I wrote my main essay on rewilding and quite a lot of work to do with um, Jungian archetypes. And I was actually told to drop the Jung because it was unfashionable. And then a few years later, it's, it's all over the art scene again. So it's kind of quite interesting how, um, how things ebb and flow in what's, what's accepted in contemporary thoughts and in the contemporary art scene. So actually whilst I'm talking I decided because I'm much more of a visual person than a talker person I'm going to show some slides of my work so that maybe you'll get a rough idea of what I'm doing as a visual artist so I'm just going to attempt a screen share here. Okay, <clears throat> so I've talked kind of briefly about my background and how I feel this has come together um, where I am now. And another reason why I think my background is very relevant to the idea of activism and apocalyptic craft is that I was involved very much with some DIY organisations that's do it yourself. And these took the form of being underground art and music venues. And I really took this feeling of self-governance and autonomy with me into my later life, which I'm which I'm, I'm so glad I was part of those scenes because um, this sense of self-governance and working in small groups together and how I was working in my younger years really, I feel really mirrors all of the grassroots organizations coming together now in contemporary environmental magical groups, people coming together to change something. And these have always been around, and especially and Britain's got a long history of people working collectively in co-ops, and, and, and especially since the 70s. But I think it wasn't so mainstream. It wasn't in the spotlight. It was still very much an underground, similar to witchcraft and magical practice. It was very much underground. And now, now is the time. Now is our time to really <clears throat> be able to stand up and not be hiding in the shadows anymore. So I'll just go through 
some of these slides. Um, these first couple are from a piece I did years ago in the a private performance piece I was doing in the woods in Stockholm about 10 years ago. And this is the only documentary from these pieces. And they are um, This one is the documentary. And um, just before I move on, thinking about the figure of the witch, I don't want to be too prescriptive in this talk, but um, I would say there's various understandings of witches and witchcraft nowadays, but I know that Hutton, in his recent book, The Witch, gives a very Good brief overview actually in the foreword of this book in which he, um, the book is called The Witch, A History of Fear from the Ancient to the Present. And he does mention that in today's time, especially Anglo-American, there are different understandings of, of the witch. Um, one of the main ones being a person who uses magic for whichever outcome. A practitioner of a nature-based religion, such as a pagan religion, or a symbol of independent female authority and resistance to male domination. And it's really interesting to me because this last sentence, I think, really encompasses the um, the, the new witchcraft we are seeing and the new the, um, the younger, mainly female population embracing the witch as a symbol of empowerment. And I always think of the, the Queen of Wands from the tarot deck when I, when I think of this, actually, you know, the very empowered, strong woman, firmly grounded and with all her passions and she's contained within. So, there's also the fact that to be a witch in certain countries is still a crime. And we can't forget our, you know, rich Western privilege in the fact it's now hopefully safe to come out as a witch and to call yourself a witch. I mean, I still, I still have to um, pick and choose who I tell because it's, um, for some people, it's still very controversial um, to identify yourself as a witch. But I would say that to me, witchcraft is a force of nature. The witch as a figure is both feared and in fear, empowered, and at times powerless, the ultimate other. One who is mistrusted by men for their intuitive connection to the liminal. One who reads nature as a language, who is inherently connected. A conduit rather than empty vessel one who cannot be defined, ever-changing, ephemeral yet permanent, the shadow which only exists in light. She is the eternal outsider, the perseverance as an archetype. I think I wrote those, um, I just wrote those notes when I was first asked to do this talk in, um, in reflection because I haven't read Peter's book for a long time, but I do know a lot of what was written in the book and in the manifesto really resonated with me. And I would say a witch is a being who is trying to live as attuned to the cosmos and the yearly cycles 
and in tune with her own environment and body as possible. One who may or may not use elemental forces combined with her own energy, psyche and will, which take the form of rites, spells or workings. So these are just some of my thoughts I wrote down when around Not so much an explanation, but my personal, <clears throat> my personal view on witchcraft. But I do think we should keep in mind the fact that labels and specific categorization are actually the tools of colonial powers and patriarchy. So sometimes these aren't essentially useful when we actually try to talk about something as complex and nuanced as witchcraft and magic. So I've just, even though I've just kind of defined witchcraft there, or my take on witchcraft, I do think if you, if you were to narrow it down to just like one kind of archetype, you would be in danger of falling into the very methodology which instigates moral panics and witch hunts, and which could in the future be used to give validation to a pointed finger. I mean, there's one other, um, I mean, there's, there's many people now who are writing about witches and witchcraft, but one, one other definition, which I'm very, um, which I was very drawn to, is from Sylvia Federici, who says in her book from 2004, Caliban and the Witch, Witches embodied everything that capitalism had to destroy. The heretic, the healer, the disobedient wife, the woman who dared to live alone, the overhair woman who poisoned the master's food and inspired the slaves to revolt. So this goes in, um, in tune with some of the other definitions of the fact that the witch is the woman who was feared, the outsider, the woman who was feared for her innate powers and craft. And I think the stronger we become and the more we embrace our witchhood, the more we are to be feared, but as a force, as a force for good. And I think the only people who would fear us are the ones who, who are more intent on destroying the planet and destroying nature rather than the other way around. So I'm just gonna talk through some of my work here, which I was starting to do. So these are some images from the first rites I did in the forest in Sweden, where I was looking at land as territory and the body as territory and looking at a really good pamphlet called Burning Women, which was talking about the correlation between the witch hunts in England and the land reform acts. Then this next piece is my very, very first interactive rite that I did in Stockholm in Sweden. I'm not actually sure why we have sure why we have this here, but and this was um, on top of an artificial hill which is built made up parts of the old city of Stockholm. So it had this kind of psychogeographic resonance as well with all the memories of the hill. And this took place for the autumn equinox in 2013, I think. And we had a great turnout actually. Originally I was only expecting 12 people and we had really good turnout, including some families and kids. And there's another image on top of the hill. This is from a piece I did more recently in 2018. And quite a lot of my rights I do, even if they're public and interactive, 
I specifically don't document them. I've done a few at festivals recently which have gone undocumented because I want them to be about the people being in the actual space and experiencing something rather than it turning into just another Instagram post. So this was a small write I did on an island in Stockholm. And this is, these are just a couple of images of the aftermath. And hence the fire. And I've been working a lot. I have a project I've been working with the past few years, which is my own kind of personal alchemy and a way of becoming attuned to the cosmos, where I have a fire at every equinox and solstice, and I save the ash from those fires, and then I make these ash paintings. I mean, this one's quite large. This one's like one and a half by two meters but normally they're quite small as well. And some other images left over from personal performative work. This one, I was cutting my hair every full moon for 13 moons and saving the hair, which became an artist book. And this was from Topography of the Witch, which was a two year ongoing project investigating my own magical experience of doing rites in tune with um, certain sacred places I would visit. This was, so this is one of the um, ash, it's not a very good photo actually, but one of the ash pieces, which is actually painted with layers and layers of ash from a particular, I think that's from the winter solstice a couple of years ago. This was exhibited in Stockholm in November 2019, along with four other women working with esoteric themes or esoterically with their artworks. So we came together as a group of five in homage to Hilma Klimt's Femme, the five group working together. Here's some of my later pieces, which I've been working on where they're porcelain trumpets for listening to the land. So I really have this thing about how we should listen to the land and connect with nature. And these are for people to actively listen to the land similar to a conch shell. These are some, again, personal performative pieces, which I make at every new moon, dedicated to Hecate, where I use pomegranate juice the fruit of the underworld and other juices and anything else which is available. I think I can see some green tea here and some other things. And they are ink blots and the word blot blurt in Scandinavian means sacrifice. So they can be their small sacrificial offerings. And this piece is a sacrificial bowl which was shown at Plum State's conference two summers ago. And lastly, here are some stills from a performative rite I did for Belting last year, actually near, nearly a year ago now, inside a locked, empty gallery space because we, we had semi-lockdown in Sweden, so everyone had to come and witness the performance through the glass window, so it was quite interesting. Um, they were, they were experiencing it, but weren't part of it this time. And we made a film of this, which was exhibited online with a group of Danish artists. And I turned, I was allowed to turn the whole gallery space actually into, uh, yeah, my own private <laughs> magical space. So I had sigils on the walls and, and I painted a huge magic circle on the floor. And then here's some of my latest work where I've just been looking at death and the body and death rites and how we honour the dead. And this is ongoing work I'm just making as part of my course. So just to give like a very rushed kind of brief overview of um, that's one way as a contemporary artist I work with magic 
and ritual, but I would say one thing I really did want to emphasize was the fact this isn't just This isn't just the fact that I'm someone who thinks it's, you know, an interesting topic to talk about or to kind of bring into acceptable artwork or something like this. It's the fact that I, all of the, all of the performative rights I do are in specific spaces outside. They are all consequential in the fact that I hope the people taking part will go away with this experience and it will affect how they look at nature and look at place. So I'm very much into cultivating the idea of, if we talk about rewilding, the fact it can, it can work on a very, very small scale and the scale of rewilding yourself, but then rewilding in connection to spaces which may have been overlooked, green space in the city or the hinterland, the liminal, the heterotopic space in the city, which may, you know, we, we don't all live in this, um, in the north of Sweden, where you've got all these beautiful open spaces. So when I first started doing these rites, it wasn't so much that I wanted witchcraft to be accepted or acceptable and I still when I do them I don't really there's no explanation as to whether they are a performative piece or a magical piece happening even though obviously I'm an artist so it's presented as um, interactive performance but I really do believe that in a way without being too pretentious, all art is a magical, all making of art is a magical act, because if you want to think of one contemporary definition of magic as change according to will. So you have the idea and then you manifest the idea similar to the fact of the act of imagination. And then when this runs alongside your other work, if you've done any internal work, this really helps. So I really wanted to actually talk more about rewilding, but I am conscious of the fact I may be running out of time. I do really want to emphasize the fact when I talk about rewilding and nature, I'm not talking about some romanticized Eden of your or anything. I'm, I'm talking about how we can move forward as a future for, for, the, for the best for our planet and animal kin and for the human race. And I do, if we're talking apocalyptic craft, I think we have to actually, there has to be some seismic shift. We have to be subverting more. We have to really be opening up and we have to be recognizing that this force is here. This force is with us. The force isn't going to go away. The craft isn't going to go away. The lineage has survived for so long. And we're, you know, and we're having this regardless of the arguments for or against the populism of witchcraft, we are having this amazing revelation taking place. And if you think of the apocalypse of being the time of revelation, I, we, we are living through this. Uh, I think so. I think it's really up to us which tools we use to try and make some kind of change. And um, there's various ways of being an activist. And uh, the reason why I just think um, visual art or performance art is a good tool is just the fact that
I would say is just the fact that um, the visual language isn't, there isn't a right and wrong and there isn't a right and wrong way of understanding it or of interpreting and I know I know there's a lot of fear and anxiety around art but also it's very emotive and it's very immediate and it has this um very yeah emotive kind of instinctual effects when um people engage with artwork which maybe words don't have the same or the facts don't have the same and contemporary science doesn't have the same effect um and art has this kind of allowance you're allowed to you're you're not seen as you, you aren't the psychologist or you're not the scientist or you're not the physicist and or you're not the you know you you're actually allowed to similar to the chaos magician actually you're allowed to bring disparate ideas together and present them in a different form and then see where they go and, and allow and it really allows for an opening up and a new way of thinking so i i think this is why arts you know I would argue in a way, obviously, as an artist, the, it's the ultimate portal or gateway to, um, to change. And there's other people who have written and talked a lot about art, the blending of art and the occult and the culture. And um, we had quite a few speakers at my conference the other year in Stockholm. And I know people like Carl Abrahamson have written a lot about this amazing marriage between um, art and the occult. And I think it's very strong. It's definitely an apocalyptic craft. And long may it continue, just as my leaving the last words, which aren't actually my words. I want to say one thing which did really strike me when I first read um, Apocalyptic Witchcraft. Peter's book was the manifesto, and I love manifestos, obviously being an artist, and the manifesto really struck a chord. And the first line, I think, in itself is powerful, and um, just it's kind of where I think we're at now. I, th I still think, um, I haven't seen his talk yet, he may have moved on, but, but this is totally where I'm at with my witchcraft and my need to act and make some kind of change because the first line of the manifesto, if the land is poisoned, then witchcraft must respond. Hey, thank you for taking time to listen today. I hope what I'm talking about kind of resonated with at least one or two of you. I'd like to really thank the Crash team for having me and Simone sp specifically for inviting me. And I look forward to seeing some of you on our Q&A in a couple of days time. Thank you. Bye bye.